I had like no money in the bank because I had just bought a house probably a month and a half before. That. Welcome back to another edition of the Skid Steer Nation podcast. Our guest today is um, not only a contractor, but also a friend. I was blessed that he's willing to come meet in person, so we don't have to do the Zoom call for this. His name is Sam Nellinger. He owns Nellinger Excavation. He's based out of Brimfield, Illinois, which is just about 15 minutes outside of Peoria. And because we have a little bit of a relationship over the years, I thought having a little fireside chat kind of be more relaxing and, and a little more uh, chill for us. So to all of you, holiday cheer with the fireplace rolling in the background here. Um, <clears throat> so Sam, I'm, uh, thanks for joining me on the show today. I really, really glad you, you made some time to come meet with me. Um, means a lot to me. So the, what we kind of do on this show is like get your background what got you your fire burning to get into land services and then talk about your like the maturation process of day one to where you are today and then kind of like where your goals are going along the way too so um for me i always found it interesting that you know you grew up on a farm you're not you're not afraid of hard work <laughs> Yeah, and your dad, your dad and grandpa made you pay for the nights after a party. Oh yeah, big time. Did that. Yeah, like what kind of words did they make you do? Uh, well, they loved making me clean green bins. I come home after a party, and they knew I'd come home late. They would uh, make me clean green bins. Yeah, that is summer when it's like eighty degrees at seven o'clock. That's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, and then that if you fell in love with racing quads. Yep. Right. So talk me through that a little bit. Like what got you interested in that? Why, why did you get so passionate about it? And, uh, yeah. So I, uh, like a typical Midwest guy, always, uh, rode four wheelers growing up, you know, we rode everything with wheels. And, uh, so I was rode and I always wanted to race, but I never had money to. And, uh, I was working and needed a hobby because all I was doing was working and I was burning myself out. So, um, started racing four wheelers. Didn't know if I was going to be good at it or anything. I just decided to do it and then um, found out I was good at it and really liked it. Met a lot of really good people and pretty much traveled the United States to just race them. And where, where did where did this where did you travel to with this? Like, give us some destinations. Um, been to Florida, Colorado, California, Ohio, Michigan. Pretty much, are probably at least twenty states and. And was this just like a passion for you, or were you good enough that you had sponsors to help offset the costs? Yeah, it's sponsors and stuff. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without any of them. Uh, everything's so expensive. Um, you know, I'd blow motors up all the time. So I just called down to Texas and give them a motor and they, yeah, I had a lot of great sponsors. But, uh, you know, a now wife, Matt, really uh, definitely made it happen because. Well, I can't believe she stuck with me. I'll be out for weeks at a time since I raised them. That's yeah. awesome, man. And and I'm always intrigued by this. Like, there's just, it's got to be an if. It's a when, not an if. Like, broken bones. They happen. How many? Yeah, broken. Both ankles, wrists, arms, collarbone, uh, dislocated knees, pretty much every extremity you can think of. So, hey, you're 27 now, right? Yep. You feel like a normal 27 year old? No, I have arthritis and everything in my lower half. I got arthritis. Yeah, yep. Cold mornings, free wrestling things. That's the basically comes out from racing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that and just being young, stupid. Yeah, yep. So, in addition to racing, you were also a union carpenter, correct? Yep. I was a union carpenter for uh, seven years. For seven years. And did you do carpentry while you were racing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I probably raced more than I did work, but um, I had a cool boss that uh, allowed me to do that uh, kind of thing. I was good at what I did, so I don't think if I was good, I would have been able to do it. I think he probably fired me. Yeah, but yeah. Yep, nice, nice. Take care of me. And so you were in the carpentry union for how long? Well, um, six or seven, six or seven years. And then how recently did you get out of the carpentry? Um, April. Um, yeah, probably April last year. 
So 2020, we're in March, April, sometime. What made you get out of the union? And what, did, what, did, what was your next step for you after you asked? Uh, well, I was new and worked for myself. Um, obviously, I had a lot of different ideas of what I was going to do. It might have been out. Um, all I knew is I can operate pretty much anything. And so uh, farming was out. On, um, couldn't farm with my family for uh, due to circumstances. And uh, I got into uh, argument with the superintendent on job one day and decided I'd add enough in that environment and uh, walked out. Didn't even tell anybody. I just left, get it grown, and uh, made a Facebook page for no longer expedition. So, so the same day you walk out of the dream, you create a Facebook page for no longer excavation. Yep, yep. Had no plan. Nothing in that week um, after I had quit, started a Facebook page, trying to make a uh, Google My Business. It was not very successful, but did that. Went and bought a uh, Kubota tractor. Um, what size? About uh, 3,000 pounds, 3,500 pounds, real little. Came with about 12 different attachments. And uh, yeah. Yep. So we started and off the races you went with your little tractor. and Yep. And a Facebook page. Yeah. Cool. So, so no set up LLC business yet, no business phone number, like no nothing, right? Just you at home with a Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. And did your phone ring? Um, and it, yeah, it did, did. It actually did. It was actually somebody, I didn't know this person, but it was a friend of friend. Um, Took a chance and I did a small grading job next to his driveway. And that was all it took. That was all it took. Well, how did you use that one one job to like grow? What did you do? Like uh take photos of it and did you post it and did you share it? Do you have people share it? Or like I mean, you're on Facebook, so I'm assuming that's a method here, right? Like, yeah. So I had everybody I knew. Um, try and share for me. Everybody, um, did that. Did some low budget sponsored ads on stuff because obviously I didn't have much money. Um, and it was just looking back, it's like a whirlwind. I can't even believe where I'm at right now, starting with I mean, a tractor and just with that jet. It's crazy. I couldn't even tell you exactly how it progressed, but it happened. Yeah, because like we met shortly after you started the business. I mean, like a week. Yep. So your father is used to work with my business coach, Eric. Um, so Eric, who works with the Small Business Development Center here at Bradley University, they're part of the SDDC, which is funded by the SBA. We're going to use a whole bunch of acronyms here. But the SBDCs, they're state, and they're in every state. They're typically partnered up with some sort of a university. And if anyone is going through issues with business or wanting to set up a business or needing somebody that understands the framework of business, I highly recommend you guys go look for the small business development center in your area. So that was my selfish plug for a second there. So but anyway, Eric was our business coach. Like I meet with Eric weekly to go over skits to your nation, to make sure we're on point with our goals, to make sure our teams grow the way it needs to grow. Like he's my accountability partner um, for my business. But he and your father used to work together, and he told me, hey, my friend Chip, his son Sam just quit the union and bought some equipment. Now he's out doing land service work. He's like, well, I really think you need to meet him. And I'm like, what, what do I need to meet him for? He's like, well, I think he could use a little bit of your tutelage. So, so we get it set up through, through your dad and his friend, and uh, we end up meeting for lunch. And I'll never forget, like, he walked in, and he was like, hey. <laughs> but you were just so, like, why does this guy want to meet? What's his angle? Like you were so hesitant, so preservation. Yeah, what was going through your head when you came in the day? Like, were you even wondering why you were going, or where were you at? I had no clue what. Well, I was tired. I was tired. It was hot. I, and yeah, I was going to meet you, uh, and I had no clues about. Didn't know if it was a formal deal or what. All I knew is I was dirty, and I am not a super good talker. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was, uh, I don't know. I thought that you were going to try and uh, use me, actually. Yeah, that's right, obviously. Well, it's turned out that it did not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did. Make sure we state that yeah. record here. But <laughs> no, like, um, I thought it was awesome. He was, like, he, was like, he was a young kid who just said, 
I'm going all in on myself. Like I use the I use the saying "burn the boats." Like if you want to take the island with the troops, you burn the boats so they can't retreat, leap, right? Like you had no exit plan. Like you were, you jumped in and you were either swimming across the lagoon or you were gonna die trying. And I, I and that was what really drew me to you. I was like, God, he doesn't have a backup or an exit strategy. Like he's not one foot out the door. If this doesn't work, I still got the curb. Like you were like, I ain't never going back there. I'm out. I, this is what I'm doing. And, and that's what really drew me to you to be like, God, this guy's got passion and grip. And, you know, if, if I can, if I can help him as a favor to my friend Eric, kind of maneuver some of the, the marketing, networking, business aspect of the land services to help him get a successful ground. Like, I, I felt like it was something I wanted to do. It's something that I was actually making me feel good too. Um, through that process, though, we, we became pretty good friends. Like, we talked, on a pretty regular basis, not just about work anymore. Um, and that's been pretty awesome. So but back to your story. Like, so here we are, April, you buy a tractor. How many months until you're like, this isn't cutting it? Um, uh, I don't even think it was a month, honestly. Uh, it wasn't super long. I started going and uh, decided that I needed to get a skid steer. So I went in, uh, to an auction and uh missouri suburb missouri allen box gets how did how did it, and i always i love how you paid for this so let's talk about that for a second like like you didn't have any income coming in so like your mindset was i don't want to pay this yeah right? yeah so uh but you didn't have the money in the bank either i had like no money in the bank because i had just bought a house probably a month and a half before that right so and i was also getting married this year so yeah there's a lot going on i had the ceremony okay um yeah so i took all of basically all of the stuff that i had for racing spare parts motors side by side everything i liquidated all of it so you literally liquidated everything was the one thing you were super passionate about yep to grow with yep so you sacrificed that whole area of your life and today i'm gonna walk away from it for a while yeah because i need that money to go separate I love that, man. Like, like nothing comes free. Like, yeah, everyone, oh, you had the stuff to sell. I'm like, yeah, man. Oh, they tell, that's like selling your dog. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, how committed are you? Like, you were you were that committed. And I always thought that was awesome. So, so yeah, you're a month in. You get a skid steer, get your equipment. The phone's ringing a little bit. Um, what kind of work were you primarily doing? Oh, anything and everything. Anything I could do to make money. So, to, yeah, I like to call you guys job wars. Job or job or so yeah, and at the beginning, kind of have to be like you just kind of like hey, I just need some cash flow, some revenue. I need some good photos of projects. I need some testimonials. I need some reviews on Google. Need your like I'll do it all. Right, it doesn't matter what it's for. Um, and then it was just a few months later that you noticed your phone was ringing a lot for land. Yeah, yeah, I saw uh, an opening in the market, and so I. Found a mulcher in Minnesota, and I went to drove to Minnesota, and um, and went to pick up a mulcher, and started doing up. Yeah, and this was a disc mulcher, not not really a drum motor, right? So a disc mulcher. Yeah, so you came back to Illinois with a disc mulcher, and like you, you know, you worked that thing hard, you marketing it hard, like you, like I always say that that became your niche. Yep, like that land clearing service, mulching trees. Leaving a clean, shredded bed for vegetation to regrow. Like, like that was your niche. You worked hard to, to create that niche. And you actually got so busy with that that you were starting to turn down other work, right? Yeah, that's pretty much all I was doing was uh, mulching. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It's a good time. And uh, there wasn't a bunch of other people in the area doing it either at that point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was that was awesome. And I'll never forget going to that one job site when they do. We were gonna do some drone footage for you, and you caught some chunk of debris, a, a car run. I know, but you caught something else, and you shot that thing from eighty yards in the field, across yeah. the field, over the road, and barely cleared my truck. Yeah, and I was like, by feet, by I mean by feet. It was like a big chunk. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I couldn't believe it flew that far. And I sure as heck couldn't believe yeah. that it didn't like land smack dab in the center of the hood of the F-350. I was like, God, I got lucky on that one. And I was like, I looked at how far away I was. 
Yeah. I knew those things were powerful. I knew they could drew. You know, I knew they threw debris a far away. But I mean, I mean, it, it was hundred yards, yeah. at least a hundred yards. I, I, that was that was pretty pretty shocking. I've been around that type of equipment for a long time. I've never seen or I just so the angle you hit it on, the trajectory you came out of that disc mulch. I don't know, but it was we I mean, have a shot out like literally like a rocket. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was fun to see you working that day and all that. So you finished out 2021, like focused on land clearing, right? Yep. And over the winter, you knew you needed to, well, two things over the winter. You knew you needed more equipment to get to where you needed to be in the land clearing industry, right? Yep. So what was your thought process about your next steps to grow your business, to be the legitimate full service land clearing company you want to be? Um, well, I, uh, I'm not sure. I just knew that I needed to uh, break out of the home motor market as best as I could because it was, uh, you know, middle of the COVID deal and everybody, a lot of people lost a job and then everybody went out and bought a steer in a mini X. And I knew I didn't want to get cluttered because it was starting to get really saturated. So I went out and uh, bought a big excavator. How big? It is uh, a 60,000 pound. Which to me is big for Illinois for the work that I'm doing for Brad. Um, but yeah, it was that's pretty much how it happened. Spray time, um, flew down to Pennsylvania and found a deal there because he couldn't find anything here and bought it and had a truck back to Illinois. You know what I mean? And then the other thing I want to ask you about the winter time too, because the winter's in Illinois, like your work, the work season here from Ankh, like the ground's frozen months and months and months. Like, if you make it to the middle of November, end of November, beginning of December, man, God was good to you. And you have to ground, like, because it, it could shut off beginning of November, some yeah. years around here. And then it could be March, sometimes April, before you can even get back out there. Look, as it's just such a hard, cold winter here. Frozen to muddy, lazy and muddy, 100% it is. So, so like, over the winter, like, you, you just started this business in April. You've made it through the year. You're able to stock some money away. Like, but you knew like you had to do something for the winter. Yeah. So like what 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 was your path, your plan and path for the winter to get through and survive that first winter? <laughs> well, I, know. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my truck or the skis here, what I was gonna do with all I knew is the only way to make my in Illinois for a contractor like me is possible. Yeah. I did it. Yeah. And I and I'll never forget, and this was something I, I thought was I was really glad you heard and listened to me on this because we talked about that winter snow falling a little bit in the in the fall. Actually, it's summer. I, I remember asking you in August, like, what are you going to do this winter? Like, if you wait till winter, it's too late. I mean, you have to have a plan for the even winter. But at the same point, I also remember going, we can't focus so much time on winter that we're not, you're not utilizing your wall to make as much money as you could, right? And... um we kind of came up with the idea and, and made some, you made a bunch of phone calls. And I made a couple on your behalf for you and all that. It worked out in the end, but you're not a winter contractor. You just need to put some money in, burn some diesel, make some cash, right? Yep. So they get subcontracted out with like some commercial landscape companies that do a lot of snow plowing, but primarily truck and plow or snow blower for sidewalks. And you can go in and say, hey, man, I've got a big pusher box and it's kids deer and I can blow off these commercial retail shopping malls, hospitals. Large apartment complexes, I can blow out their their work in half the time you guys do it. So even though my hourly rates are more expensive, it's gonna be more financially beneficial to you because they're getting paid about a lot. And it worked out really well for you last summer, didn't it? Or last winter. Yeah, it sure did. I'm uh, plowing stuff for him again this year. Right. And I think what I love about that is it's like, hey, I lined up a, a way to make some money in my in my down season that requires very little yeah. marketing effort. I don't have to maintain a list of 50 clients. Like I can stay focused on growing my true business spring, summer, fall, but I still have a revenue stream in the way. And I think that was the, the one thing that I really liked was the mindset of that was like, hey, if we focus so much on what you're going to do over the winter, then you're going to be missing out on spring and next summer. Like, we need to stay focused on your excavation because snow plowing ain't. Look. So, to, you know, to think outside the box a little bit and make some phone calls and go network, shake some hands, meet some people, beat the streets. You were persistent. Beat those streets until somebody said, hey, man, we'll take you on as a sub. Yeah. Um, I spent days calling. I'm, I remember. Days. 
I remember. So I, I just I remember I just read a book the other day and got uh, it wasn't a book it was an article, which is why I keep remembering who said this. But like I think it was Dean Graziano. He says if you're always persistent, you'll never fail. Like you have failures along the way, but the persistent always is. Yeah. And I think like that that story of you and the winner is a great example. That was like. You know, you call it 10, 15, 20 landscape companies. Most of them, they probably back. A couple of them told you no. But you didn't say, well, nobody needs my services. I guess I'm just going to sit on the couch all day. Like, you were like, no, nope, somebody's going to use me. I'm going to keep going until I find somebody to, to give you a shot at it. And I always love that about it. So you get to your winter. We get in the spring. You're, you're, you're not even 12 months old as a business yet. Yeah. Right. You just bought a 60,000 pound excavator. Yep. Um, what was your mind at? What were you thinking? What was your goal for 2022? What were your hesitant of? Uh, I just knew that I needed to add more services than just mulching because it was becoming oversaturated in this area. And I was trying to break out of the home moving market. Um, so I thought, you know, well, let's go buy a big excavator. That way I can actually do full grain jobs. I could do ponds. And I can also do demolition, um, you know, where it's up river. And then you kind of had a focus on demo, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah. How did that work out for you, the demo? What was your experience diving into the demo market? And it's rough market around here, rough market. It really, uh, if you bid against, there's two companies in our area, if you bid against them, you are not going to get the job. It's just not, not going to happen. Um, they got scrap yards and everything right by the junkyard. It's just you can't compete with the crisis. Yeah. Can't do it. Because they're a full service from yard to finish. They're not paying for the all, you know, they're paying for the dump. They've got a scrap yard. Yeah, they're large, large union outfits. I get it. I get it. So just look, looking back at that experience, like, do you, I mean, you learned a lot and said, all right, this isn't the right niche for me. But do you look back and go, man, if I would have done a little research before I popped that excavator, I realized it. Like, I would have realized demolition probably wasn't going to be where I made my mark. Yeah. Like, it's like you didn't do enough research. You had jumped into that one too early. Well, I do and I do both. Um, you can't really, if you have to rent an expedited that size, the price is out of the job. So you have to have your own equipment. And once I actually started bidding against these other contractors, I realized they're just, you can't compete with Yeah, no. So, yes and no. I love them. I do not regret buying it. I've used it plenty, and um, it's a good purchase. I um, just have to find another way to keep it busy other than most. Yeah. I totally get that. So you started working this year, if I remember you telling me this story. And uh, I had introduced you to another guy that I think he started about the same month or a month after you did. Mm -hmm. He was a Marine that um, bought a mini excavator. A little bobcat that he had, it was just kind of started his own business, and he was he was greater than you as far as starting this thing. And wow. um, you know, he survived and, and thrived by the end of his first year too. But you guys met, started talking, and then you guys started bidding some jobs together, right? Or helping each other. How did that? How does this process do with Isaac? Um, yeah, so we uh, we ended up living five miles away from each other. And so we started bidding jobs together and pretty much doing everything together because it's just easier to do something with somebody else that's going through the exact same struggle that you are, um, which makes it a lot easier. And a lot of those jobs are required like a second hand, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're not ready to hire a full-time employee or the labor pool for part-time guys is, yeah. Yeah, is lean. So you guys decided to just do like the little divide and conquer. We'll work each job together, both of us. Yeah, and we got to the point where we were, you know, we'd be bidding a job, and then my phone would ring, and they'd leave voicemail. It started ringing, they'd leave voice down, and they would listen to them, and they'd be the exact same person calling. They're just going down the list calling people. We're like, we're, we're bidding against each other um, right now. You know, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything, everything, we work well together. It all aligns. Yeah, I take pride in their work. Um, he's a great guy, stays focused, and just it works. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I remember you, when you guys were telling me about that, and I was like, hey, if it works for you, that's great, right? Where inside my head, I'm going, 
why in God's green earth would you work half your time on somebody else's jobs? That's what everybody said. That's what everybody said. Like you're sitting here trying to grow your own business, and you're like doing the work on Isaac's jobs, and then he's working on your job. Like it was a head scratcher to me. Like, and I saw it at face value, but I'm like, God, we, you have long term visions and goals. And like, this isn't what gets you to the, to the end goal, right? Yeah. Um, but I kind of like kept my mouth shut. I was like, hey, he's happy. Like, they got to do their own thing and like they're enjoying it. It is a lonely gig when you're out there every day by yourself. It's tough. You know, I know there's a lot of guys that own these, these contract companies by themselves. And, you know, you don't have a fire every day, man. And it's hard to get moving some mornings. Yeah. If you get that second person, it just lights that spark a little bit bigger. Or me, they've got a great spark. And yeah. It makes everything you time to people. Yeah. So what's going to happen with you guys? Like, what's the maturation? Is it just like two buddies high five and after they help each other out and you keep doing that? Or where are you as you all in? So we are uh, merging uh, companies and we're going to make a new company together. Um, and yeah, it just makes sense for us to do that. Um, it's real hard to do everything by yourself, like I said, and having somebody who matches your work uh, flow and your dedication to the job is rare. That doesn't happen often. So when that happens, you just gotta, you just gotta go with it. Yep. Yep. And, and we talked about this a long time ago, like you can't be everything to everybody. Yep. You gotta be something to somebody. Like what's your guys' niche? Where are you using to specialize in? Um, so we're going to specialize in septic, septic pumping and basically drainage services. From my dream is you're talking more agricultural. Yeah, field tile for farmers. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Not residential regrading sloping like no. a larger, larger ag. Yep. Field tile repair, replacement. Yeah, okay. that's what we would like to all. Uh, yep. That's what we'd like to do. There's also an open area for that. So yeah. So what was I mean? So you're gonna go from land clearing to demolition. And now you're jumping into septics. Like, why septics? Well, it is recession proof and define that real quick. So, um, when something's happening, uh, like with land clearing and demolitions, they all slow down, um, when the economy slows down, if your septic is not working, you have to fix that. Yeah. So yeah, like, you know, Hey, we're not sure the economy is going in the next six months. Yeah. I don't really need that three acres printed out to have that beautiful park light sitting behind the house. I'll wait and see what happens. You know, where I spend my cash, I want to keep cash in the bank account. That's right. And that septic tank goes out and you can't flush the toilet. You're like, how fast can you get here fixed? Yeah, that's right. There's nothing you can do. You got to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. So I, I love that. I think, you know, I think the foresight of, of like saying, hey, this is a time where it's, you know, it's a little uncertain. Guys are kind of curious what's going to happen next year. Um, with after the midterm elections and all that, and, but there's like there's a little bit of uncertainty, like the inflation rates through the roof. Well, there's talk about diesel at seven dollars a gallon in Illinois. I know it's already been closer over that in other states. You know, like where where where's it at? Where does it slow down? Where do we start pulling back our expenses? Yeah, um, yeah. But I think I think you know, and they have. I mean, it's a cycle. It happened all the time. Like I I was you you were younger, but like 2008, but and like it's all doom and gloom in the moment and then you look back at it and like oh it was shitty but it wasn't like the apocalypse yeah like yeah and like we make it out to be a little bit worse than it typically ends up being because that's it's our fight or flight instinct i yeah. i feel especially as a small business oh 100 percent hundred percent yeah you know yeah even i like you know, with the attachments like if you guys are going to start slowing down at work you're going to slow down on attachment settles like you know so you know, even I have a lot of conversations with people about what's going to happen in 2023 with this market's going to take us and what I should expect as a, as a business owner myself and what I need to do to prepare and, and plan for it and how I can differentiate myself on the marketplace. So, but that's what I kind of want to talk about right there. Like I just kind of said that, like differentiating yourself in the marketplace. Like everyone can't run out, like be a septic guy in their town because they did have 50 septic guys in a town. Yeah. But I mean, if you're first to market, you know, we still call tissues Kleenex. Yep. Nobody buys a box of Kleenex anymore. And they're like Walmart brand or well, seven dollar generals. They you know they've got the name recognition for it. So 
how much competition is there in your area? There's competition, but it's not oversaturated yet in this area. Like other things involves a lot of me later. And a lot of people will that get into this, uh, they don't they try to get away from that like I did. You know, they try to get away from manual labor, they don't want to do manual labor. Um, and that's is involves a lot of manual labor and it's gross. It's I mean literally, man. That's a handy job. Yeah, not be to do that. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean we off topic a little bit here, but we spend Isaac and I spend countless hours and in uh, each other's sheds trying to figure out what we're going to do as a business um, to uh, not slow him down, you know. And he came up with the idea all by himself. Um, what about septics? And it is uh, smart for that. I I didn't think of it. Um, I wasn't. Uh, he came up with it, and it was a great idea. So. Mm-hmm. It's recession proof, like I said, and it works. Yeah, and like, and like, you know, the whole vision of the pop truck you guys wanted to buy in the near future, too. Like, did that come just like, hey, we're doing septics as a pump, too? Or were you getting a bunch of phone calls because you do septics that people want to know if you all like, hey, I saw you did septics, the pump. Like, where did the idea, like, man, we're going to do, we're going to do septics, we should be pumping these two. Yeah. So we get calls pretty often about pumping. Um, but the thing is, is when you, in Illinois, you have to take a pumping license test and you also have to take an installer test. When you do the installer test, you're also uh, a certified inspector. So when you go there to pump these septics, you can also inspect them if there's another problem. You know, if you already know, like it's going to need pump regardless. If, there, if you got to do a new install, it already has to be pumped. So you go there and you look and you see what's wrong with it. And if there's something wrong with it, other than you need pumped, you flip, bring it to the attention and you're already up a foot in the door to do that job. Yeah. So, and, and I like that a lot. I'm always a firm believer. It's a lot less expensive to get a customer to do a second job with you than it is to acquire a new customer. I mean, the cost of advertising to, for the new person to know who you are. The time it takes for you to go meet with them and the extra hour or two you spend with them so you build that trust relationship. You're not doing other work. Like it's not it's not inexpensive to get a job. Like I think most people know that. Like there's an investment for that. every job you get. But repeat customers, that investment's a lot smaller, man. Like you don't have to build trust. You already have it. He's not getting bids from six other people typically. Yeah. Um, when can you start? And we'll help them, and then let's get it done. And it, I have a, yeah, maintaining those relationships and looking at every client you do work for as a, a relationship with them. And whether you, you know, call them up randomly out of the blue to say, hey, I'm checking in six months later, how things are going, how's the rest of your property, how's your septic working, yeah. or sending them a little direct mail piece for the holidays. Just, I mean, all that little stuff. Handwritten note. Huge fan of handwritten notes, man. I think everybody should send handwritten notes. It's a dying art. Nobody does it. And man, when you get one, it's memorable. Well, it's memorable. Like you get that, and like, dude, Sam wrote, thank you. Like it's just it's just memorable. Yeah. Um, like we just a little thing. And I really think like, the difference between a good business and a great business. It's the little things. Yeah, I agree. Or it's, I mean, it's not how well you can grade the driveway or how wonderful the septic is laid out or the culvert you replaced or, or any of that. It's all the other things. How's the appearance of the staff when they show up? Are you there when you say you're going to be there? Do you leave when they need you to leave? Or do you wait till the job's done? You know, are the estimates and the invoices professional? Are they handwritten? Um, are there little thank yous that you send along the way? I, I think it's all those tiny little things. When you calculate those and you do them consistently, that's where you take a good business and try and do it. Absolutely. Okay. Anyway. So what, what are some little things that you try to do with all the clients you work? Um, I call people back after about uh, a month to make sure they're still, uh, everything's still operating as it should be, no matter what I did. I like to call people up for about a month. Um, I kind of lack in that area as far as uh, uh, the handwritten note deal. Well, so why did you read my handwritten? Yeah. yeah. 
you can buy, you can pay a server. It's like five dollars a pop, you know, right? The car blew out and nailing out or all that. But um, I think the other thing that I remember you did last year, if you're still doing it or not, but didn't you switch the way you did your estimates? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I changed to uh, Joist actually. So what were you doing before that? Um, QuickBooks. So you're just using a basic QuickBooks. Yeah. You know, everyone knows what they look like. We've all made them. We've all sent them out. Just a generic line item estimate. Yeah, I never sent myself one. So I sent myself one to see how it looked. And that was, it was terrible. It was horrible. The way it lay out, everything was bad. Yeah. So I switched to Joist. And Joist is a lot louder. Um, it's an app. It's, uh, it does, it links directly into QuickBooks. Um, all that. It's, Top notch. What made you like Joyce and make, made you make the switch to using that for your estimates? Um, you can add different line items to it, and you um, you can do better descriptions. You can put your logo on there, your website, everything. You can do all kinds of stuff on there that you can't. And I remember, right, you can also upload photos. Yeah, you can upload photos to site so photos. So you were taking up two extra minutes to like take Google aerial photos and then highlight the area for like, and this was when you're doing a lot of land clearing. Highlight the area with like lines or whatever, and like, hey, this is the specific area you're working on. Then you get some photos of the ground. Now that you're doing all that, yeah, that's a big deal. Adding pictures to the people like the yeah. and I mean, not that most people take advantage of this by no means too, but I thought it was neat when you pointed out to me but that Joyce app is built in financing for clients. Too. Yeah, it, it does have built in finance, third party, um, um, definitely helps. I have had a few people use it. Have you? Yep. Yeah, it gives you, uh, oh, it also gives you notification with somebody opened or viewed your estimate every time. Which is awesome because I remember yeah. when I did sales, when we did the manufacturing company, we'd send a bunch of leads out and all that. I'd always like, hey, you have those notifications turned on. And every morning I'd go in and see, hey, John Smith opened this email seven times over the weekend. Yeah. This was getting the first phone call Monday morning. Yeah. Because he's hot, right? He's hot. If this guy keeps looking at it, he's thinking about it. So, I mean, that's, but again, like those are little things that you can do to make it dead to make your business more efficient, better, more professional, yeah. and along the way. So I love all that. So um, yeah. So back to you guys. Like you've had a wild eighteen months. Um, you've tried a couple different niches. Yeah. You've bought some new equipment. Some good, some okay. Or you started partnering with another contractor. You're deciding that that's, and I mean, like if somebody said to you 18 months ago, hey, over the next 18 months, you're going to do these 15 things, would you look at it and go, okay, I believe you? No, it sounds fake. It sounds made up. It does not sound like something that would actually have. Um, nothing that has transpired in the last 18 months sounds like something real. Yes. I mean, yeah. What's, what's the most surreal to you in your mind of anything you've done this last eight? I mean, just... Being able to work for myself and, yeah. and actually continuing to do it is the most rewarding thing possibly I've ever been in my life. Yeah, it is, man. Like it's, there's a lot of struggles. Yeah, there's a lot of hard days. Yep. There's some shitty customers. It's all worth there's like it's There's a lot of things, right? But, man, to look at that job when you're done doing it and go, that's my, my name's up. And they're going to tell somebody, call the sample. Yeah, good song. And it, well, it is, and it's, and there's, you know, there's that, that, that pride. It's just, you can't replace that. You know, like I'm, I'm the same way, man. Like I'm awful. I'm awful proud to say that I am the Sphere Nation, man. Um, I'm awful proud to, to be true to what I envisioned my business to be. And I think that's the biggest thing I try to tell people is like, know your core values, know who you are, know what's important to you build your business around more because if you said every day I'm going to write handwritten notes to 50 people to try to get new leads and you can't even read your own handwritten, like it's not going to work for you, right? It's like putting a round peg in a square hole. Um, so it's really about building like a business around you. Yeah. I agree. You got to, you got to stick to your, to your morals, everything that drove you. Yeah, to start, you need to stick with that and continue. Yeah, and learning how to say no. Yeah. You know, like, Big. as you as you start to, you know, I think we, everybody did it. Like, 
you get the low hanging fruit, you do as much work as you can, generate some money, get your name out there. But yeah. eventually you start finding what you want to do. Yeah. Right. I just talked to a guy today. He's like, hey, I did a few jobs of tree management and land, you know, some tree removal and management. And there's a huge, it, I'm getting rid of everything else I do. This is all, I am, I have my truck, I can do this, I can do that. Like, He's going all in on this one niche. I'm like, good to you, dude. Because that's when you get, that's when people know who you are. That's what you learn for. Yeah. So I got, you know, again, back to you and Isaac. I, I love that. But um, question I wanted to ask you. December 2023, you and I meet again with Sydney's chairs. Tell me what the last 12 months looked like. Um, well, we... Uh, about six hundred thousand dollars revenue and on truck, um, possibly employed. That would be that would be ideal. Yeah. How many septic systems did you put in? Oh, uh, uh, four a week. That's that's. I don't know if it's possible. But I'd be four uh, four a week. I love. I love. I always ask that question because if I say, "What are your goals for the next twelve months?" You just get people like deer in headlights. Yeah, like very few guys are like dialed in and where they want to go as a goal. But they all know what the vision of where they want to be is. Yeah. And so I, I always ask, hey, if we look back for the last 12 months, like, where are you at? Because what you actually did is you actually set your goals. You just got to write them down. Hi, Hazel. For those not watching the video, my dog Hazel has joined us and trying to jump into Sam's lap. So um, making her podcast debut. <laughs> But anyway, so I think obviously that's a great exercise. Like if you're having trouble setting your goals for your business, whether it be 90 days, one year, three year, five years, just envision where your, your business, just envision what you look like your business is at, at those times. And then you can start building those, those goals yeah. off of that. It's just a nice way to get your mind thinking the same thing, just in a different way that allows the creativity to come up. Yeah. So um, anything that like, stand out to you over your life or your experience or where you're heading that like you want to like mention or talk about or expand on or you got to, you got to go with the flow. You got to roll the punches. It's a must, you know, uh, you always got to be adapting. Yeah. You have to be, everybody does it. Walmart does it with their automatic teller machine things that they have. Got to adapt always. Yeah. It's how it's we. That's a great, that's a great lesson to learn, man. Like, you know, we, you know, I think my least favorite thing to hear is when someone says, well, it's the way we've always done it. Yeah. No, you do. I had that mentality. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a different world. It moves a lot faster than it had 25 years ago. I mean, this has even been, I remember what my first smartphone or my first iPhone was 2008, nine and 10. Yeah. We're talking about 12, 15 years ago and you went from a phone that you could call people to. Sam, I literally run my business on my phone. Yeah, me too. I, I remember somebody said the other day, and this made me just, well, look, that's crazy. Your cell phone has more computing power, more access to knowledge than Bill Clinton had when he was the president of the United States. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But Bill Clinton wasn't the president that long ago. That's the part that's crazy. It's not like you're saying Thomas Jefferson. Like, it was Bill Clinton. Like, it was just that many years ago. And now they're evolving. And it's just like, it moves so fast. <laughs> you need to be, we need to adapt and move that fast too. Yeah. Right? You have to. So, well, Sam, I can't thank you enough for coming in today and uh, sitting down with the fire. We talked so long that it's almost burned itself out. So, we'll have to throw another log on there and have some hot chocolate or something. Kidding. But... <laughs> But man, yeah, again, thanks so much. You're an inspiration to me just for nothing more than when you commit to something, you're going to do it. And you're not going to do it by running in like a, like a bull in the china shop until it breaks. Like you're determined to find a way to do it. And if you don't know how to do it, you're determined to find somebody that can help you find a way to do it. Um, I always say, like, you don't know what you don't know. And the sooner you can admit that to yourself, and the sooner you can find somebody that knows what you don't know, that's when you can see some serious growth. Yeah. So I know you've got some great mentors in your life, um, Dwayne being one of them. Oh, no. Dwayne is. Yeah, your, your dad or your grandpa, 
uh, some other friends and stuff. So you know, just keep doing what you do, man. I'm sorry. Good support group. Yeah, you got a really good support group. So, well, buddy, appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. And uh, to all of you, we'll see you in the next episode. And don't forget, if you are an owner of a skid steer and you want high quality American made attachments, Skid Steer Nation has nothing but that. We pride ourselves in saying that we have done the homework for you. We have interviewed these manufacturers. We have checked the quality of their builds. We've checked the consistency of their products. We feel that they make a higher quality product than some of the large corporations. And we also make sure that their customer support and service is there when you need it. Um, so yeah, we've done the homework for you. We've talked to countless manufacturers. We found what we believe are the best ones that are family owned and put passion, pride, and quality over profits. So if you're looking for any attachments, please stop over at skidsteernation.com, check out our selection, and we'll see you next time.